It's a real honor to be here today with our special guest, Myron Sugarman. Myron Sugarman is joining us from a book tour of his critically acclaimed work, From Meyer to Myron, The Chronicles of the Last Jewish Gangster, a work that really tells the story of the role of the Jewish Mafia in the impact they had not only on American and world Jewry, but on society at large. Mr. Sugarman, would you please tell us and share with us the story and the role of the Jewish Mafia vis-a-vis -vis the American Nazi Party, vis-a-vis -vis the brown shirts, mm -hmm. and that history. Okay, but let's, let's start with the very beginning. And the very beginning is how did these gangs, Jewish gangs, mobsters, and so forth develop? Basically, they come out of the, the um, Lower East Side, they come out of Maxwell Street in Chicago, from the ghettos of Newark, New Jersey, the Third Ward. Uh, these are kids who are tough kids because it, it's tough times. Economics were tough, the uh, immigration, um, they just came to the country. Some of them were born on the other side and came as young kids. Others were born here, raised in the United States. Like my father, Allah Vashalom, he was born in Newark, New Jersey, 1900. And he was part of that world. So those gangs formed, you had tough kids, a lot of those kids went into prize fighting. A lot of kids went into becoming outlaws, you know, living outside the law, gangsters and so forth. The um, transformation takes place over a period of time because there was a, um, an opportunity that was provided by prohibition. The passing of the Volstead Act 1920, which made it an illegal act to, um, criminal act to either manufacture or to um, distribute alcoholic products throughout the United States. It was a fantastic opportunity for kids, you know, to suddenly to make money. First of all, the kids started out as running protection for the mob bosses and for the bootleggers, like Sam Reinfeld in Newark, New Jersey, like Arnold Rothstein in New York, who was very well known, very famous. Arnold Rothstein was really the granddaddy of them all, and he introduces, uh, the, he was introduced to uh, Meyer Lansky and to Bugsy Siegel. These kids, together with others, Dutch Schultz, Lepke Bookhalter, Longies Wilman in Newark, New Jersey, Joe Stature, Doc Stature, Niggy Rudkin, and guys all over the United States, they started out running convoy protection, protection for the bootleggers on the trucks because everybody was stealing everybody's alcohol. But uh, eventually these kids were so talented and so entrepreneurial that they themselves become the bosses, all right? Arnold Rothstein was killed because he refused to pay off on a, on a gambling debt. The other guy was Sam Reinfeld, was superseded by Longies Wilman in Newark, New Jersey, Doc Stancher, and they become the bosses. And Doc, the, the, one of the most famous of all of our gangsters, of our mob guys, is a name by the name of Abner Longies Wilman from Newark, New Jersey. People do, outside of New Jersey never heard of him, and yet he was on the same level with Meyer Lansky. Meyer Lansky was given always top honors because his name was always the one connected and associated as the leadership of the Jewish mob. But actually, he shared that leadership with Abner Longis Wilman, with Joe Doc Stature, Benny Siegel, Bugsy Siegel, and others. But essentially, Meyer was, Meyer was considered the boss. Now, in the 30s, and I always tell the story, that there is a certain connection uh, between a Jewish patriot that was born and raised in Palestine, pre-state Israel, and a Jewish gangster that was born and raised here in the United States. Their personalities were very much alike, meaning that in a, when a push came to shove, it was a question of Jewish patriotism. 1932, um, in 1929, of course, we all know, that was the, um, the Great Depression, and then the, not the Depression, it was stock the crash, the stock market crash, crash. Yeah. and then 1932 32. was the Great Depression. 1933 was the, was either 32 or 33, the end of the Volstead Act, all right? Now, with, with the collapse of the economy, we had a rise of anti-Semitism, not just in Europe, but it was imported to the United States by the name of Fritz Kuhn, who was the head of the brown shirts, the Nazi Bund Party, the American Nazi Party. You had the silver shirts throughout the entire United States of America, 
and other groups of anti-Semites. And it was a terrible time. Now, in Newark, New Jersey, it was a, one of the beginning of the battlegrounds of the Jews with the Nazis, with the American Nazi Party. And we had a large German population, going all the way back to the time of the uh, middle 1800s. Our water was very good, and it was therefore you had German, import, uh, German entrepreneurs, breweries, manufactured beer. The Germans to come after the fall of Kaiser Wilhelm World War I, they settled in Newark, New Jersey, Irvington, Union, and so forth. Guttenberg, New Jersey, all over, Dover, Butler. And we have a rise of tremendous anti-Semitism. And after these rallies that they used to conduct at the beer gardens on Springfield Avenue, Newark, New Jersey, or whether it was up here in Yorkville, uh, on the east side, they would go ahead and the Nazis would feel uh, all inspired and they'd start to pick on Jews in Jewish neighborhoods. Well, in Newark, New Jersey, we had a prize fighter by the name of Nat, Nat Arno, who fought on the name of Nat Arno. And um, funny story, my father was involved with boxing. He had a partner, his name was Jaime Kugel. Jaime Kugel was the referee at the Law Gardens in Newark, New Jersey. And in those days, you, um, a lot of the guys uh, fought uh, under assumed names because they didn't want their parents to know that they were uh, uh, fighting. So um, <laughs> there was a guy by the name of Greenberg fighting one night. Right? Jaime Kugel had no objectivity when it concerned uh, a Jewish um, fighter. Got the benefit of the doubt. So Greenberg got knocked down and he's first round. He's on the canvas and Jaime Kugel goes over to him, give him the count, one waits a half an hour to say one and a half, and then leans over and he says, listen, you dumb Jew, Greenberg, don't you see what I'm doing for you? I'm giving you a slow count. Greenberg looks up at Jaime Kugel, he says, but I'm not Jewish, I'm Italian. Eight, nine, ten, you're out. <laughs> the, um, we had prize fighters, a lot of ex-prize fighters and current prize fighters at that time, and uh, Nat Arno went to Longy's woman, who was the boss of New Jersey, known as the Al Capone of New Jersey, that 65% of the alcohol that came in through the port of, in the ports of Port Newark, Port Elizabeth, Perth Amboy, were all brought in by Long East Woman. He had dominion over the city of Newark, New Jersey. The mayor was handpicked, Mayor Ellenstein. He was a Jew that was picked by Meyer, by Doc Stature. I'm sorry, by Long East Woman. And so every time that the Nazis would meet, our guys, Matt Arno went to Longy, got a blessing, formed an organization called it the Minutemen in honor of the Minutemen that were called upon in the time of the Revolutionary War. So that, let's say, for example, guys were in a saloon or the bar, the club, a hangout, phone call would come in and say, listen, we're going up to Springfield Avenue tonight. We're going to Schwab Hall. We're going to beat up the Nazis. And guys would jump in cars and cars would go up there. And sure enough, what they would do is they took um, stink bombs and threw it into the place, stink out the people as they came running out. They would beat the crap out of wood, monkey wrenches, baseball bats, brass knuckles, whatever they could hit them with. And um, this war went on for many, many years. In fact, it's documented in an excellent book called The uh, Nazis in Newark, written by a very good friend of mine, Warren Grover. This was a, a complete, um, this was not only in Newark, it was in New York, as I mentioned, in uh, Minneapolis, uh, you had wise guys, Jewish gangsters up there that took on the silver shirts. A fellow by the name of Dudley was the head of the silver shirts and um, originally born out of Asheville, North Carolina, if I'm not mistaken. And he spread this, formed this organization called the Silver Shirts. The Nazis could work called the Brown Shirts. And they had also, they fought in Chicago. They had a lot of Jews that were gangsters, all right? Lenny Patrick and uh, uh, Barney Ross, the very famous prize fighter, and another fellow by the name of Jacob Rubenstein. And every time I mention Jacob Rubenstein, I'll ask my audience, do you people know who I'm talking about? I said, no, we never heard of him. I said, how about the name Jack Ruby, all right? Jack Ruby was a Jewish patriot. By the way, getting back to Meyer Lansky, he was the one that led the group that, fed, that beat up the Nazis in Yorkville, and he was partners with Lucky Luciano, the very famous head of the Italian 
uh, mob. Now, to show you how patriotic our guys were, they never took any money for any of this. Lucky Luciano went to Meyer Lansky and said to Meyer Lansky, Meyer, if you need help from our boys to beat up the Nazis, count on us. And Meyer Lansky's response was, Lucky, Charlie, thank you very much, but this is a Jewish problem and we Jews will resolve it by ourselves. And everybody that fought to beat up Nazis were Jewish. In Newark, a few Italian kids wanted to just get in on, a, the, on the fun, yeah, on the action, so they joined up. So that was the story as far as the, and it also happened in Los Angeles and happened in London. They went into the east end of London, the, the Mosley. Oswald Mosley was the head of the black church, the anti, uh, he was an anti-Semite fascist, deliberately went into the um, east end for the purpose of uh, harassing Jews. But the Jews put up a resistance there. Different time, different age, we had a different element. The, the second area, if you would share with us, that you, you write about in the book, there was an embargo. Truman had an embargo both against the Arabs and against the Jews in terms of getting arms in the It was Palestine. a neutrality act that stated that it would be a criminal act to ship arms and weapons uh, to uh, Palestine, either to Jews or to the um, Arabs. Well, the Arabs didn't need the arms, they had the British. Jews needed arms. We only had 600,000 Jews. Many of them were just escapees, recent escapees from the, from the concentration camps. We didn't really have an organized army, and David Ben-Gurion was desperate for weapons. Came to the United States. There was a fellow there by the name of uh, um, Zimmel Resnick. Zimmel Resnick owned the place called the Palace Amusements in Asbury Park, New Jersey. And um, he was an old compatriot of David Ben-Gurion. They had fought in the Jewish unit of the British Army in World War I. And he was a Zionist like the vast majority of people at that time. Um, and he gathered up an enormous amount of weaponry. The, um, the shipping of all that, the weapons that incident, oh, let me tell you that there was a group called the Sonnenborn Group. And that is documented in a book called The Pledge 1970, written by a fellow by the name of Leonard Slater. And it tells the story of the American Zionist under the auspices of an organization called the Sonnenborn Group that brought up surplus weapons throughout the entire United States and had it shipped. Now, shipping going through the Port of New York or Port Newark or Port Elizabeth had to be done through the, uh, inf through the under the auspices of the mob because you were shipping in contraband, in, in, contra in violation of American law. Truman did recognize the state of Israel 20 minutes after Ben-Gurion made his statement about the, made his declaration. But at the same time, he submitted to the influence of the State Department and the British government invoking the Neutrality Act, which is basically sending, is sending the Jews to, again to the death camps. After all, who was the best fighting force of the Middle East that were trained by the British was the Jordanian Legion. So um, the Sonnenborn group did an effective job of supplying weapons and arms, shipping in via Los Angeles and New York and out of Panama. There was a gangster in Panama that had an influence over the Panamanian government. He was connected with the Chicago outfit. He was with Al Capone. His name was High Red Larner. Shipments were sent out on the Panamanian flag. Anastasio Somoza, the dictator of Nicaragua, also supplied weapons and arms. They got 3.5% kickback. Now, um, the, the, the interesting aspect of this is the Ergun, under, ben -Gur under Menachem Begin, they sought out the mob. The mob guys, when they heard that Jews were fighting, made an invaluable contribution in the form of money, weapons, and more than just simply moral support. There was a rally held at a place called Slappy Maxi's uh, um, Comedy Club on Wilshire Boulevard in, in Los Angeles. And they raised $220,000. And that money was used to stock 
a ship called the Atalena. It was shipped out of uh, Marseille. And uh, that was an Irgun shipment. Now, the Atalena was named in honor of the, it was the Nome de Plume of Japotinsky, and the ship reached Vitkin Beach. There was a major confrontation between Ben Gurion and um, Begin. Menachem Begin. Begin was on the ship at that time. Menachem Begin didn't hold, didn't, uh, was known not to have personal feelings towards, against Ben Gurion. Although it was always said that Ben Gurion held Menachem Begin in great contempt. Their ideologies were completely opposed to one another. And so um, Begin was on that ship that night. And as they were unloading the arms, making a determination where that was going to be designated to, I don't know what happened because I spoke to people, but there was a breakdown of communication. There was an Ergun ship that was supplied by the mob. And um, they say that it was Itzhak Rabin that fired a, sh a, a rocket or a missile onto the ship and blew up the ship with all the arms. They were able to, they, 19 Jewish boys were dead that night, killed it. Now, Begin was able to reach shore. The boys saved them, got on a radio, secret radio that night and stated that um, very clearly that Jews do not kill Jews. There'll be no revenge. And single-handed saved the, in, the country from a civil war. Absolutely. The, the arms that were being shipped to the Irgun, to other groups. So the, the Jewish mafia used their connections with the Italian mafia who controlled the ports? Is that how it was done? Yeah. The Zionists went to Meyer Lansky and to Longy's Woman. And so we need the help of your, of your guys at the, at the Longshoremen. And this all I mean, it goes back in time when the um, SS Normandy, a French luxury ship, was commissioned by the United States two months after war was declared. It was shipped and sunk. And um, Meyer Lansky was asked by the Department of Navy Intelligence if he would cooperate with um, the American government to use his influence on the piers to tell the longshoremen to um, be patriots and to be aware of sabotage and espionage, since the Normandy was mysteriously sunk in the port of New York. There were two bosses. One was Eddie McGrath over the Irish and Soxlands over the Italians. Now, the Department of Navy was concerned at that point whether the um, Irish would be anti-British and whether the Italians would be pro-Mussolini. So they needed the help of the mob who controlled the piers, all right? That was controlled by Lucky Luciano. So Meyer Lansky made a deal with the government at that time through his lawyer, Moses Polakoff, to have Lucky Luciano brought from Denimore Prison <coughs> down to Great Meadows Prison in New, York, in New York. And ultimately, Thomas Dewey, who was the prosecutor, ultimately eventually became governor and tried to become president, ran against Truman. It turned out that um, he gave Lucky Luciano a governor's pardon, all right? Because the, the mob told Dewey that they would support him in his efforts to become governor of the state of New York. Lucky Luciano was received a governor's pardon and um, he, he, on the condition he would not remain in the United States, they exiled him to Sicily. But before he ex he's exiled to Sicily, he uses his influence in the ports. No, his no? influence in the port was, yeah, on the question of sabotage and espionage during World War II. 1946, he goes back to Sicily. The influence comes by the people that remain after him, Albert Anastasia and Frank Costello. Uh. They have the control now. And Meyer Lansky and, and, and um, Longy's woman were request, uh, um, Work with Costello and Anastasia. They were in the same, they were in the, in the same. Mm. They were the same boat. So again, the, the orders went down to the longshoremen. Uh, ammunition, dynamite will be declared as fertilizer. Uh, weaponry, we don't ask questions, just ship, right? 
just ship that stuff. Forget the manifest. And it was well known that tons of stuff got shipped out of the port of New York that went to Palestine at that time. You want to speak a little bit about Meyer Lansky, his situation with Israel? Okay, so Meyer Lansky, I met him the one time in my life I spent Shabbat with him in uh, the Shabbat lunch, and it lasted quite a few hours. Um, my father's original partner was Joseph Doc Stature, who was partners with Longy's Woman. They were on an equal level. Longy's Woman, however, was some kind of a special individual, tall, the name Longy gave from the Yiddish word longer, mm -hmm. meaning the tall one. <clears throat> he was a good looking guy, debonair, self educated, uh, financed Hollywood, had a love affair with the very famous actress at the time, Jean Harlow. He was well known in his time. Well, he was on the equal level with Meyer, but Meyer was always at the forefront. Anyways, Doc Stature made a deal with Joseph, with Robert Kennedy, the president, the United States Attorney General, while he was Attorney General with his brother, John Kennedy, that in dropped the income tax evasion charges, he had accept exile, and he went to Israel. So and this it, was the early 60s? Or this was, this the was 1963, mm -hmm. right? That Doc Stature made a deal with Robert Kennedy, and he went to Israel. And he lived at the old Sheraton Hotel on the Yarachon in, um, Tel Aviv. in Tel Aviv. <laughs> he was quite a character. Meyer Lansky was low-key, a gentleman, soft-spoken. Uh, where Doc was an old-time gangster, bona fide gangster, and made no and made no bones about it. He was very smart, but um, he told me I used to, when I used to go to Israel. He was my father's soul. They were buddies together. They grew up together on the playground in Newark on Prince Street, and they were partners <laughs> in, in Runyon Sales Company, the jukebox business, jukebox and game business. So Doc Stature, when I used to go there, I'd call him on the phone. He'd come downstairs. He'd put handcuffs on me. You ain't going nowhere, kid. You're with me the whole goddamn time that you're here in this country. All right, I got to keep an eye on you. I'm going to tell you my stories. And sure enough, he would tell me all the stories. One Shabbos, he says to me, you'll be here for Shabbos lunch. You understand what I'm talking about? Doc. <laughs> I said, what did he do? Get a sudden renaissance of religiosity, we're going to meet in Shabbos. Don't be a goddamn wise kid. I'll give you a slap. All right, sure enough, he showed up. And I show up for, for lunch and a bunch of people. And he was having him, he was at the, in his, and all of a sudden we're sitting talking. Who walks in? Meyer Lansky. It was a seat, empty seat next to mine. And he spent the whole afternoon telling me stories about himself. <clears throat> He had just left the United States because he knew of a pending indictment that was told to him that was coming down on him. So he ran, and it was July 1970, and this was September 1970. Yeah. So we spent the day conversing, and at the end of the day, um, by the way, there were tables all around, and he was observing religious families singing Shabbos and Miras. And uh, he says, you know, look how nice that is, huh? I regret I don't have that in my life. All right? At the end of the day, I'm curious as to the reason why I'm invited. I'm a kid. I was 19, 70, I'm, oh my God, I'm 32 years old. And these are the these were the these were the what do you call them the legends, and they want to take me to the corner of the hotel because they want to ask me questions, and um, they don't want anybody around. And sure enough, the questions pertain to my father's partner, Jerry Katina, who was the boss of the Genovese crime family, Italian, and a very good guy, and they wanted to know about his legal status because they had heard 
that uh, they knew that he was incarcerated for refusal to testify at the grand jury after being granted immunity. Years later, I realized what it was all about. They were concerned about who was authorizing the rake-off money coming out of Vegas casinos, going to Florida, who was authorizing the transfer of those funds to go into the Swiss bank account. The Swiss bank, by the way, was known as the International Bank du Credit. That was a Mossad bank. The fellow that owned the bank was Tibor Rosenbaum. Yeah. Eh? A fascinating figure. Also a in, fascinating in figure. Holocaust history, but, Jewish yeah, history. Yeah, in Budapest occupation. And um, he was the guy that, he was the bank that the, that the, um, that the, the Israelis used to launder funds that eventually was bought the Messerschmitts from Switz, from Czech Republic, from Thomas Masaryk. And then eventually it was the bank that was used by the mob for the purpose of laundering the monies that came out of the rake off out of Vegas. Now, everybody always asks me, well, whatever happened to Meyer Lansky's money? Two things. That bank went bankrupt and there's no federal insurance all right. And the Swiss bank. And the Swiss bank. That bank went bankrupt, number one. So everybody lost their money in that. In the, oh, everybody had their money there. All right. Secondly, Cuba. The, the Castro... Nationalized everything. Just closed down the casinos. <coughs> it said from people that were reliable sources, that Meyer Lansky had $16 million of his own money in the 50s invested in that Riviera Hotel and the others. So that was a gigantic sum of money. I also believe, knowing how that world operates, he might have had to make good on monies that were loaned to the Riviera Hotel by giving up shares in Vegas. The end of the story is, Jimmy Blue Eyes, Vincent Jimmy Blue Eyes, a lawyer, told me that Meyer Lansky died with um, very, very little money. He picked up $300,000 of street money that he gave to Meyer Lansky. Some say that his brother Jake ended up with some of the money. Nobody ever knows. Nobody ever knew. But. I, I gave you a pretty good indication that that, whole, that bank went bankrupt. Cuba was a disaster because everybody had their money in Cuba, including my father. But six months before the revolution, somebody had a premonition, let's get out of this for different reasons. They wouldn't want to testify at grand jury that they were connected to the Riviera Hotel in Cuba with Meyer Lansky, and it was my father's partner that just wanted to get out, and they sold out with a profit. Could you share with us, and I'm going to make a statement that I, I don't know if is accurate or not. One of the ways that Lucky Luciano became the head of the crime family is he was the first generation that was willing to work with Jews and with Irish, not to have a strictly Sicilian or a strictly Well, the, or origin, the original bosses were xenophobic. They'd have nothing to do with any other ethnic group. They didn't even like doing business with the Calabresa and the Apolitans and so forth. They wanted to do business with Sicilians and the more close that they were from the same village, they were more comfortable. All right? They were born in Italy, raised with old school mentality. They were called the, the old mustache beats. The Young Turks were Lucky Luciano, Albert Anastasia, Frank Costello and so forth. Lucky Luciano. And we're talking the late 20s, 30s. This is um, probably around the 20s, and sometime in the 20s. The, the, because you have to understand, these, these were still kids at that time. They were in the middle 20s. It, probably in the later part of the, of the 20s, because the, the syndicate meets in Atlantic City in 1931, uh, the, uh, the, the, the new mob. But it could probably be late 20s, early 30s, maybe. And um, sure enough, 
there was a hit team that went and killed Joe the boss Masseria after he had killed Lucky Luciano, after he attempted murder on Lucky Luciano, left him for dead on the beaches of, of um, Coney Island. And by the way, that's how he got the name Lucky. He survived. They changed his name from Salvatore Lacania to Charlie Lucky Luciano. All right? And that's how he gets the name Lucky. And um, Lucky Luciano went to Meyer Lansky and to Bugsy Siegel and said, we have to get rid of these two old timers. We're never going to go anywhere. All right? So they killed Joe Masseria. Bugsy Siegel with three Italian hitmen. And the other guys uh, were uh, commissioned were four Jews. There was, again, Benny Siegel. There was, um, I think, uh, one of the guys from Dutch Schultz's outfit. May have been Teitelbaum. Another guy I always insisted was Louis Rush. And the fourth guy was Sam Red Levine. Wore kippah, ate kosher, and swore that he would never kill anybody on Shabbos unless it was absolutely necessary. <laughs> so that's how Lucky Luciano surfaced at the time. They offered him the, the opportunity to be the boss of all bosses, and he turned it down. He says, just give me my own crew. We'll cut up five, five boroughs. Each borough gets a boss. And that's, that's basically the way it, 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 it um, evolved. What was, so Lucky was in Meyer Lansky, what was the name of their family? Well, L Lucky, Luci Lucky Luciano had his own family, then eventually became known as Genovese. Genovese. Vito Genovese was, um, it wasn't a very well-liked guy, but after Vito Genovese, ah, after Lucky Luciano was Frank Costello. Frank Costello took over, and then Vito Genovese commissioned a hitman. The hitman was the chin, the guy that used to walk around New York in pajamas, all right? And have a, if I would come in on him in his apartment, he, you know, pretended that he was crazy and he'd have a, an umbrella, he'd be in a, in, a, in a shower holding an umbrella, talking to himself. He was the hitman that hit Frank, Frank Costello, sent by Vito Genovese, because Vito Genovese was ready to make his move to become the boss of the Genovese crime family. So it became known as the Genovese crime family. Mm -hmm. And when they were called Money Incorporated, they were... Murder Incorporated. Murder Incorporated. That was different. Murder Incorporated was two Jews and one Italian. That was Lepke, Louis Lepke Bookhalter, and the other guy was Jacob Gora Shapiro. Together with Albert Anastasia, they had an organization called Murder Incorporated. The newspapers gave them that name, but the idea was it was contract killing. If you needed somebody killed, pay the price, they'd go, they'd kill. Dutch Schultz was killed by Murder Incorporated in 1935 in Newark, New Jersey. By the way, people don't know it, but Dutch Schultz was a Jew. He was a German Jew by the name of Arthur Flegenheimer, <laughs> all right? And took the name Dutch Schultz because there was a gangster from years ago, prior to his time, and he took on the name Dutch Schultz. He liked that name. But he was a Jew and then converted to Catholicism at the end and died. Uh, he was a victim of, a, uh, of an assassination. And the guys that killed him were Jews. They were sent by Murder Incorporated. Charlie Bugs Workman did 20 some odd years uh, for uh, killing uh, Dutch Schultz. You mentioned one time, and you mentioned in the book, the difference between the, Jew, the Jews' children, the Jews who were in the mob, what they wanted for their children, as opposed to the Italians, what they wanted for their children, how they well, raised them. You know, uh, some Italians uh, wanted better for the kids to send them to college and so forth. Carlo Gambino's kids were very well educated, all right? Uh, a lot of guys uh, were very well educated, but a lot of them, they were t brought in, you know, into, into that world, into that life, you know, like it was some kind of a great honor to be a member of it. In fact, I know guys that uh, the mothers were Italian, and I know one guy in particular, the father was Jewish. They switched it around. They gave him his mother's Italian name so that he could become a member of the mafia. All right. The rule was always that you had to be Italian, 100% Italian. But, you know, guys played politics in order to get the kid in to become a, a member of organized crime. Like, today, nobody, you know, anybody with any sense of... Um, any, with anybody with, with a, a common sense doesn't want to be part of that world anymore, all right? 
It's no future. It's a, it's a one-way it's a one way ticket to go to jail, all right? And then to say, well, they proved himself he's a man's man. He stood up, he didn't rat, and so forth and so on. These are, th you know, you're getting now measured by that. But in the meantime, 20 years later, your wife, your kids, they didn't see, and so forth and so forth. But also at the same time, you know, this is easy pickings. For the American government, the Italians are like sitting sit ducks. You can take them easily down. They, you know, they go one, two, three. It's the way it is today. And there's a certain attraction. Oh, we took down the mafia with this and that. So. That's how Giuliani made a name for himself. Giuliani made a name. He never went after the Colombian drug cartels. He went after the Italian mafia. Um, it was easy for him. It was easy for him. The cartels, um, but the, the mob was right, right there, all right? He, he found it very convenient. Dewey, same thing. Dewey took down the mob. That's how he... That's how he made the name to, you know, become ultimately a, a candidate for governor of the state of New York. He took down Abe Kid Relis. He took down uh, Lucky Luciano. He took down Lefty Bullcalter, uh, Dutch Schultz. All those guys he took down, all right? He, he put tremendous pressure on Dutch Schultz. In fact, it was Dutch Schultz together with Jacob Gore Shapiro that wanted to assassinate Thomas Dewey. And that's one of the reasons alleged that they killed Dutch Schultz because he wanted to kill Dewey. All right? He was obsessed with it. That's number one. Number two, he was in Newark, New Jersey during that period that he came from New York over here. He stayed at the Robert Treat. I think it was the, was it the Robert Treat Hotel. He, he stayed in, New York, in Newark. He used to go to the Blue Mirror nightclub on um, Clinton Avenue. And the Blue Mirror, the, the place still exists. In the neighborhood's radically changed. But you can see the relic of what once was the blue mirror. And that was a hangout. And Putty one time, the guy that was my wooden head, he got drunk that one night. And he goes into the blue mirror. His wife, as a matter of fact, was an Italian girl. She was the torch singer in that place. But anyways, he's in that place. And he's got a gun on him that night. He was going to shoot somebody. Right? And it's wrapped up in a handkerchief. And he sees Dutch Schultz sitting there with his henchman. And in this drunken stupor, he says to him, you know, you're a nobody in Newark, New Jersey. New Jersey belongs to Longy and it belongs to Doc. Now, Dutch Schultz could have killed him right there and then, all right? But Putty was fearless. He was also crazy. Went home that night. In the morning, he's living with his mother. Phone rings. She picks up the phone. I want to talk to your son. Put Putty on the put Max on the phone. Max, wake him up. Yeah. Putty, this is uh, Abe Longy. So why don't you stop down to my place, 1464 North Broad Street, Hillside. I'm going to have a little chat with you. Hey, come, yeah, as soon as I, yeah, come on down. Sure, we'll wait. Comes down, he says, did you um, drink last night, Max? He says, yeah, I did have a drink or two. Really? Were you at the Blue Mirror? Yeah, 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 I think I was at the Blue Mirror. Did you threaten somebody? Yeah, some guy, Dutch Schultz. Do you know who Dutch Schultz was? You're the luckiest Jew on the face of the earth. You should be dead today, all right? Now, why don't you stop your drinking, Max? Because one day you're going to end up dead. He got really a reprimand for that. But it was Longy's woman that got the assignment from, from, from Lucky to kill uh, Dutch Schultz. They had to kill Dutch Schultz. They're kids for the most part. Here's the interesting thing. Here's the interesting. It was Jewish pride, all right? But it ended with Jewish pride. When they put that, you know, the pride, the pride went, didn't, maybe they passed on the pride. So you see my kids of a contemporary, my age. So yeah, they go to, they belong to membership to a reformed temple. Because it's the last um, hanging on to, the, to the, anything Jewish. 70% of the kids are already intermarried, all right? So in reality, very few passed on the baton in terms of to perpetuate the Jewish people. Because these kids, my contemporaries, a lot of their families, a lot of their kids, their children, grandchildren, intermarried, are, are no longer Jewish. And um, that's one thing I could proudly say of everything is that I did pass on the baton. My father did give me enough pride 
and I think that something just inside of me said, you know, when I when my son Benny was born, your friend, your friend Rabbi Ben Sugarman was born, 1970. So at that time, I told my wife, Mrs. Sugarman, we're going to put Benny in 1974, put him in yeshiva. You remember the story? She says, over my dead body, a nice lady from Argentina, beautiful woman, great cook, great sh uh, shirts, perfectly pressed. I says, gee, I'm going to miss you, all right? And I'm going <laughs> I'm gonna to have to throw you out this window. That kid's going to yeshiva. Anyways, today... You know the story. You know the story better than anybody. You, after all, you were you were his rabbi when in the youth movement, so in the NCSY. Today he's a rabbi teaching daf yomi with eight kids in yeshivas, going to college. Fantastic family. A lot of our people, most of them, I can't think of. It. Very very few. There's another few, one or two, that the kids rebelled and became orthodox. All right, and became Torah connected. But a lot of these kids. It's just the vast majority of them. While the, the parents, while the fathers were proud Jews, super proud Jews, today all my friends, they all... Donald Trump will have Jewish grandchildren. They don't. Right? Mm -hmm. It's an amazing, you know, it's an amazing thing that uh, that pride, pride alone does not pass on. You can't give the baton on to the next generation. It was a, an intellectual decision that I made. People ask me, well, why'd you send your kid to yeshiva? You, you know, where did you, can I, you know, how did it happen? I said, well, it's very simple. It was strictly an intellectual decision that if I'm, my kids are going to end up being Jewish, they need to end up being Jewish through the religion. And, you know, also ethnic pride, culture, history, and so forth. I'll give them as much as I can as far as that's concerned. Now, a lot of people say to me, you know, Myron, uh, Brother, your son is a rabbi, eight kids, teaches Daf Yomi. How do you reconcile your, your, mm. your, your, your adventurous uh, ad lifestyle and your son being a rabbi? Well, how do you reconcile? So Rabbi Zev Siegel, I love to him. You remember Rab Rabbi Stately, great rabbi. The day that I put Benny into the yeshiva, Rabbi Siegel said to me, oh, Mr. Sugarman, no, I know God. He knew my father. He knew my uncle. He was great. He knew everybody, all the Jews in Newark. And my uncle used to go to his shul for, for um, certainly for your sight. And other times he'd go. They were a Newark family. That was my father's brother. And um, he said to me, how are you going to deal with the question when your son comes home? And he wants to eat kosher food, and what are you going to do with Shabbos? He wants to go to shul, and all these other things. He's wonderful what you're doing. So slowly but surely, I started to self-educate and to uh, raise up a level at least to understand. There's one thing I never felt comfortable being around Jews, Orthodox Jews, and not knowing what the hell's going on. I, I said to myself, I don't like that. So over the years, I self-educated. And for years and years, you know, I've connected with the orthodoxy and my son and the kids and so forth and so forth. And do these kids like the idea that, you know, they are the grandson of the, the chronicles of the last Jewish gangster from Meyer to, to, to Meyer to Meyer? Well, in a way, they're very happy with it because they have a, a most mm -hmm. unique grandfather that others don't have. And they have good sense of humor about it. As a matter of fact, I said to uh, the two older boys that eventually, very soon, I guess, they start with the dating process, huh? So we're talking with the, the older kids, Akiva and, and, uh, and um, Zev, the one I call uh, um, the poker face, and the other kid I call, uh, I call him Jackie Joe the Chinaman, all right? Um, <laughs> so I said, when you go on a date, how do you think you're going to be able? What are you going to? How are you going to start a conversation? It's very simple. I'm just going to hand the girl a book called The Chronicles of the Last Jewish Gangster and tell her to read it. And if she likes it, call me. We'll go out next time. <laughs> he said, "Cut right through everything." It's like, terrific. He says, "This is my family." Would you like to share with us some personal anecdotes? Some yeah, funny, sto funny yeah, stories. Funny stories. Funny stories. Okay. 
So there was a, a gangster, an old-time gangster, Milton Tootsie Roll Levy from Newark, New Jersey. And he, his health started to clean. This guy, he was a character. We went to Israel, four guys, a, a young gangster, my contemporary, Joey Sedano. Um, he was Italian. He was Italian. Um, the other guy was little Itzik Goldstein, a gangster, who used to be the driver for Doc Stature, and Tootsie Roll Levy. They come in one day and they say, we want to go to Israel. All right. So Joey says to me, come on, we'll go to Israel. We'll take him to Israel. These old cockers. We get on an airplane, hello, and uh, these old timers, uh, they cut right through all the nonsense. Waitress. <laughs> hey, waitress, get over here. She comes over. How can I help you? She says, incidentally, I'm not a waitress. I'm a flight attendant. All right. I'm a stewardess. So don't call me waitress. I'll call you what you No, you're not. All right, you behave yourself, all right? Mr. Mr. Levy, Mr. Goldstein, what can I do for you? All right, here's what I want for dinner. I want, I want the, <laughs> I want the flunkin, and the chain, I want the cabbage, I want this, I want soup, I want canadla, crepla. She says, gentlemen, you will get what we give you. And <laughs> Toots looks at me. He says, what kind of a Jewish airline is this? If I can't eat Jewish food, you'll eat what we give you. Oh, and they start. Now the flight attendants, they know they've got a couple of live ones, these old timers. And they come <laughs> and they start to talk to them. And uh, mm. they get a kick out of these old timers. And all night they're kvetching, give me orange juice, get me this, get me that. In the morning, when we fly over the shores of Tel Aviv, Israel. So, um, oh, before we get to that point. They give us the landing card, all right? Now, here's two geniuses. Tootsie Roll Levy and Little Itza Goldstein are now looking at the, um, at the cards, uh, the landing cards. Well, what'd you put down? I don't know what you put down. Let me see what you put down. <laughs> father, dead, D-E-D. -E Name your father, dead. <laughs> Name your mother, dead, D-E-D. -E uh, what's your nationality? Jewish. Why'd you write that? J-O-O-I-S-H. Fabulous. Perfect. The show, the, I, I'm sitting with Joey, and he hand me the cards, and Joey looks, oh my God. <laughs> now, we fly over the shores of Israel. In those days, they used to, Avenu Shalom, they used to put you get everyone letter, psyched up. Get you all lady. psyched up, and the whole crew comes over. Mr. Levy, Mr. Goldstein, look out the window. That's the shores of the Jewish homeland. That's the state of Israel. Toots looks out the window and he says, why this friggin' place looks like Coney Island? One last story. You, you want to share that story about Royce, about that young woman who became converted to Judaism? There's, in my book, The Chronicles of the Last Jewish Gangster, the, um, there was a law that was passed in 1963 by Robert Kennedy's um, Justice Department, called the Eastland Act. What it did is made the Bally Bingo pinball machine the same legal status as a slot machine, making it illegal to ship to across uh, interstate commerce to any to only to those states that under states' rights that exempted itself from federal law. And they were in the South. It was Tennessee, Mississippi, Louisiana, uh, South Carolina, some states of Maryland, southern part of, uh, uh, of Illinois, and, and, and Nevada, and Kentucky. And so, to make money in those days, I was a contrabandist. I was a bootlegger. I would buy up bingo machines from all over and deliver them to states that were, that were illegal because guys would continue to operate machines, and they needed machines. And I bought machines, I exported machines, I bought them back. It was a terrific way of making money at that time. And so um, one of the guys that I trafficked with was a fellow by the name of Royce Green Jr. Royce Green Jr. was the epitome of the Deep South. As a kid, he actually rose, rode with, this, with the Ku Klux Klan. In 1965, my wife comes to the United States from Argentina and she worked for me at the time, and we go down to South Carolina. He invited us down to South Carolina. 
He said, y'all come down, we're in Myrtle Beach, and we'll look after you, because we were doing business at that time. Now, his father was known as Big Daddy, old, typical South, the straw hat. And on a Sunday, they have all the family from all over the South come to Myrtle Beach, bringing their pies and the chickens and the corn and so forth. And a big family get together. The old man knew my father. And he puts his arm in my two locks, Clara here like this, me on the other arm. And he walks us around. He said, now this is my cousin Bertha. She all come from North Carolina. That's the lemon meringue pie that she made, all right? Now these are my Jew friends from up north, all right? And to the next one, and to the next one, and to the next one. Introducing the whole family. And they're my Jew friends from up north. Now Royce, the ladies' man, good looking guy, and he had his uh, Pelegish, Pelegish shot the concubines, all, concubines over. all over. It's the only guy that ate the uh, four Thanksgiving dinners at uh, four different states and four Christmas dinners. His last child out of wedlock with this last concubine out of Tennessee. Now, when she was 17, 18 years, they come to the United States, they came to New York. She went to go to Columbia University. And we went out for dinner that night. Royce with his mother of uh, this young lady, and we go out for dinner, and sure enough, my son was there that night, so we eat kosher. With, he was with Rebecca. And the young lady asked a zillion questions about Yiddish guy. To make a long story short, I went to jail at that time. She went to Columbia, but she sort of like was raised in our house before, you know, before I went to jail. We used to take her to shul on Shabbos with us. And I get letters in jail, and I said, oh my God, this girl's converting. Sure enough, I come out of jail. I called her up, seen her, she asked, she said, she threw the light switch before she converted. Just, you know, not to fully observe Shabbat. She converted, she goes to the mikveh. And, um, oh my God, nine days later she meets her Bashert. A Chabad guy from Haifa, a Sephardi guy, wonderful guy, blah, blah, blah. I get a phone call. Mother, Miss Jan. Jan. Mar huh? Jan. Miss Jan, I do want to have a little talk with you. I said, okay, fine, Jan. Oh, I'm so, oh, here it comes. I'm going to get my ass chewed out. She says, Marin, Royce and I, we got locked up by the feds last night. I said, oh, God, thank God, that's all it was. Whew. She said, I need your counsel and advice. And I gave her an hour and a half for what to do, what not to do, ba, ba, ba. Okay, thank you. I said, you call me any time, I love you. She said, now wait a minute before you hang up that phone. She said, I got a bone to pick with you. Said, what is it, sweetheart? You made my daughter into a Jew. I said, oh, slow down, sister. All right, the rodeo didn't start yet. Listen, how could I convert your, influence your daughter? Where was I the last 19 months of my life? Allenwood Federal Prison Camp, all right? Now, how the hell do you, you know. Accuse me. How can you accuse me? She says, well, I'm telling you right now, I'm holding you responsible. Hangs up the phone. Calls me back shortly afterward. Hey, you son of a bitch, you. You get your ass over to Brooklyn. She got engaged. My daughter's engaged to one of them Chabad guys, all right? You break up that engagement, you hear me? I, you, I, Hank slams the phone, gives me, I call up the kid. I said, okay, yeah, wanna eat lunch? Oh yeah, I heard all about you, Mr. Sugarman, blah, blah, oh wonderful, okay, eat lunch. And I said, you wanna break up the engagement? He says, what are you eating today? I said, okay, very good, that was what I was expecting. I go home, call up Jan, I said, Jan, I put a pistol to this kid's head, all right? <laughs> I kicked him, I threatened him in his life and so forth. She said, what did he say? He said, he's going to marry your daughter. She's useless. You're totally useless. She hangs up the phone. All right. Next time I get a phone call. Hey, Myron, Jan. Okay, Jan. There's a ticket waiting for you at John F. Kennedy Airport. You're going to Israel. Going to Israel? Yes. Your job is to keep an eye on that husband of mine. You hear me? You're babysitting. 
Now get your ass over to JFK and pick up the ticket and go to Israel. I go to Israel, sure enough, I wait for the flight coming in from Atlanta, and it all works. Royce, I said to myself, I got to detain him tonight. I call all the guys in the machine business, gambling machine business, all the underworld, Unterwell, Olam Tachton, all the underworld guys. They all show up, and I tell them, listen, his daughter's getting married. He's a guest of honor tonight. And they're telling stories. The guy robbed my location, took my money. I get the, we had a fight. I hit him on the head with a baseball. Roy says to me, Myron, I like these Jews. These are good Jews, right? my kind of Jews. Sure enough, the next day, we go up to Svad. She's getting married in Svad. Right? We're going up. We meet Miss Jan. We're driving up there. And Royce turns to me and says, Myron, my best poker machine customer from Mississippi is the Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. And he does his business in a most professional manner. Jan says to me, would you listen to this schmuck? We're on our way up to Svat Israel. His daughter's getting married to a Jew, all right? And he's telling you his best customer is the Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan of Mississippi. What a moron. We finally get up there, Svad. All right, now comes the wedding, all right? We go to the wedding. How she comes out? She comes out with a sheet over her head, all right? Roy says to me, Myron, that's the same thing we used to do in the Ku Klux Klan. <laughs> She gets married. We have the party, all right? Now there's a mechitza, all right? And Miss Jan's saying to me, Mar, she says, do me a favor, get over here for a minute. She says, Royce is on top of the shoulders of those young fellows that are dancing. And he's got a yellow flag on his hand. What does that say, that Jew talk up there? It says, we want Mashiach now. She says, the Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan of Mississippi is my best customer, and he does business in the most professional mind. And here he is, the schmuck waving a yellow flag, saying, we want Mashiach now. Right. Now, we go for the Yibasheva Baruch all right, we go to all the houses and so forth, last night. And he says, Myron, we're going to the airport, we're going back home. He said, would you tell that young man that married my daughter I do want to have a few kind words with him, all right? Ellie, your, uh, your father-in-law would like to, I think, give you a blessing before he leaves. Oh, wonderful. Goes over. And he said, I said, Royce, speak slow because his English isn't too good. He says, young man, I do want to tell you this. If you so much hurt a hair on the head of my daughter, I swear on Jesus Christ and the Holy Bible, I'll break every bone in your body, all right? Do I make myself clear? We go ahead. He says, is that a blessing? I said, yeah, that's the way they bless everybody in South Carolina. <laughs> 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 huh? that was this, that's a story. She's a Chabad girl with four kids living in Crown Heights, Brooklyn, and she is a angel. She is a real tzedekis, all right? Wow. Wonderful, wonderful story. Anything else you'd want to share about any interesting personalities? I think that basically we covered, you know, when I start my speech that I make, I always tell people it's like a coin. On one side of the coin is a patriot, or the kind of sign is a gangster. Flip it up, whatever way it's coming down. I, the patriot, if he was born in America, would have been a gangster. And the gangster, if he would have been born in Israel, was a patriot. There's a mentality, a dedication, a commitment. You know, you take those two Sephardi kids, it, uh, Eliyahu, ben, uh, Eliyahu Chacham, Eliyahu Ben Suri, 19 and 22 years of age, 1946, commissioned by Yitzhak Shamir to go commit, um, assassinate Lord Moyne, the highest ranking official in the um, British mandate. Committed, they, 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 they actually, they assassinated him, 19 and 22 years of age. And then they were captured, they were tried, convicted, and condemned to be hung. And at the moment of hanging, the two stood together and sang the Hatikva. 
I just cannot understand. You know, begin to connect them and appreciate. There are the two guys. There was Feinstein and Ashkenaz, who was an Irgun, and there was Moshe Barzani. One was Irgun and one was the Stern Gang. They became friendly in the Accra prison. And they told the British government, you have no authority over the land of Palestine. It belongs to the Jewish people. They were condemned for it to be hung. And their act of defiance was they had a hand grenade that was imported illegally, uh, clandestinely into the prison inside of an orange. Okay? And they stood stomach to stomach and blew themselves up rather than have the British hang them. Their act of defiance with, you know. And by the way, I think Menachem Begin is buried next to Barzani yeah. and to Feinstein. I mean, these guys were remarkable guys. The same thing, of course, the guys here. They were patriots, all right? So some people will say, well, certainly patriots, but that's real patriotism. But the opportunity to be patriots manifested itself fighting the American Nazi party, supplying arms and weapons and so forth. Nobody paid them for that. Mickey Cohn, in fact, it was rumored that Mickey Cohn sent a message to Israel, to Palestine, and told them, as long as you keep killing those British officers that killed Jews, I'll continue contributing money. Same thing with Bugsy Siegel. Was Bugsy, Meyer Lansky, everybody was involved in helping to create the state of Israel, get rid of the British, and so forth. It was a remarkable time in history. And remember, uh, the, the, American, the American people, the American Jew, didn't raise a voice of protest during the entire World War II when it was going on. Two guys had to come from Palestine. Cook, hello, Cook. Yeah, Peter Bergson. Peter Bergson. Yeah. And the other was uh, Joseph... Uh, ben Hecht. Uh, ben Hecht, ben Hecht the, the, the playwright. They gave their lives for, you know, to, to, to time, their energy, their for the Jewish people. And the American Jew didn't do a damn thing. They didn't lift the pinky, the finger, and so forth, while all those, while all our brothers and sisters were being taken to the concentration. And we knew it was going on. No pressure brought the bear on Roosevelt. And loved Roosevelt. And loved the man. Cried when he died. Our guys? They, listen, they were not ideologically sophisticated to make the differentiation between left and right. They heard Jews were fighting, and that was it. There was a much better, however, closer connection between Ergun and the gangsters. Because there was that similarity of mentality. I can go to you guys. I can trust you guys. Right? On the other hand, thank God, there was a Sonnenborn group that a remarkable job supplying the Haganah. So I think, I hope that I was able in this interview to tell you some, give some greater insight into a, a most unique story that there's nobody left to tell that story. There are books. I recommend the book called The Nazis in Newark, written by Warren Grover. I recommend the book called The Pledge by Leonard Slater, which is the story of the Sonnenborn group. I recommend Hitler in Los Angeles, a book that just came out recently. And um, my book. Uh, the Chronicles of the Last Jewish Gangster from Myron to Myron. One thing I did want to say. I spoke this week at a small group, Middlesex County, New Jersey, Jewish Center. Old timers, nice people. Next day I get a letter, thank you for being here. It was wonderful. One woman went home and wrote back to the, um, to the lady this, that was responsible for running it. Mr. Sugarman, why... Is he considered, why does he consider himself the last Jewish gangster? And she said, would you please answer this lady's question so that I could get back to her? I said, first of all, it's a great question. I inherited the love of the adventure of the gambling industry from my father, from the machines. I was born into it. Secondly, I was born and raised into that world of Jewish pride. And that was essential to the character of a human being. <clears throat> you were judged by how good a Jew you were. All right? That was transmitted down to me. And I always felt I have an obligation because that was what my father taught me. 
that Jews look out for Jews. And he would tell me bedtime stories that the other kids would be talking about Jack and the Beanstalk. My father was telling me about the story of the Minutemen, the Jews that beat up the, he participated Jew in one form or another, beating up the American Nazi Party in North New Jersey. So I tell everybody like this. I've done many things, good things for the Jewish people. The most outstanding one, in my opinion, is my involvement and concern and connection with Simon Wiesenthal, who I knew from 1965-66. I made myself go to his office in Vienna. I introduced myself to Simon Wiesenthal, and I became a close, intimate associate. He wrote letters on my behalf to the judges. It happens to be in my book, telling, stating very clearly, unequivocally, Myron Sugarman was my man in South America, helping me in pursuit of finding Nazi war criminals. All right? And um, in my response, I say, this is my greatest deed, as far as I'm concerned. And um, that, this, that this was just essential to me. Also, I go on to say, there was a very famous photograph, terrible photograph, 1943, of a Jewish kid coming out of the Warsaw Ghetto in short pants at the German Nazi soldier with a rifle pointed at him. That's 1943. He was five years old. I was five years old. For circumstances of geography, I could have been that kid. He could have been me living in the United States. I took on that kid's persona. All right? And by my involvement with Simon Wiesenthal over the many years, the work that I did for the money that I raised for him, and a tremendous amount of effort, because he used to tell me that the way we get the Nazis is when two Nazis would fight with each other, they'd run to Wiesenthal to rally at each other, and a few groschen in hand, he would buy that information. That's why he stayed in Vienna. He was a courageous hero. I wanted to say I couldn't fight the American Nazi party in the 30s, but I could certainly be a contributor by my work for Simon Wiesenthal. Right. So that's the story. Do I justify? No, I, there was no justification needed. A great judge, Harold E. Green, 1987 Washington case, st told the prosecutor, I don't know what Mr. Sugarman's doing here. What is the difference between what he does and what the Washington lottery does? He gambles, they gamble. What's the difference? Oh, she said, well, he's a member of organized crime. Well, you go ahead and prove it. He said, you go prove it. The crazy prosecutor said uh, in a probation report, I was a close, intimate associate of Jimmy Blue Eyes Alloy. I never knew Jimmy in my life. It was years later that I met him, and I walked up to him, and I said, Hi, Jimmy. How you doing, pal? And he looked at me and said, What, are you drunk? I said, No, I'm not drunk. You're my pal. He said, What are you, pal? I never met you in my life. I never met you. And I told him the story. He said, Ah, government. I used to eat lunch with him all the time in the Hilton Hotel, and he would tell me these fantastic you know, stories about John Kennedy, about Jack Ruby, about this, about that, Sam Trafficante, Santa Trafficante, Carlo Marcello, Sam Moody, Frank Sinatra, the whole story. How uh, Joe Kennedy went to his, his son-in-law, Peter Lawford, who was part of the Red Pack, and get in touch with Frank Sinatra, tell him to get his goombas, help us to elect, get elected in Chicago, West Virginia, Cook County, so forth and so forth. Right? I mean, I had access to a lot, a lot of history from these old old timers and what do you do old, what do you do what is our world all about but to get together to tell stories right mm. so that was uh, many stories to be told but i think that we had a pretty good uh, session mm -hmm. today huh I have to thank you on behalf of thank all you. of us for, for education and enlightening us. Okay, thank, thank you, you Rabbi much. Steve Weil. Right. It was my pleasure.